Hey guys, Scott here again, new beer video. Um, on this one, I'm gonna be taking a little different uh, kind of tack that I have in my last you know, two, three weeks, which I've done a lot of what is videos, the different styles and dove a little bit into the history. Um, I've done some beer dissection videos, actually having a beer. I'm gonna be continuing those, but I like to switch it up every so often because remember, I kind of do this for fun. Um, those of you who I, I appreciate all the feedback I've been getting on, you, on YouTube and, and through Facebook and private messenger, uh, just a quick reset on and, you know, where I'm coming from. Uh, obviously, I've been a home brewer for roughly 25 years on and off. Uh, about three years ago during COVID, I really got into understanding what the Cicerone program was, and I uh, really dove headfirst into a lot of the books and history, and I still reference all of them and some YouTube videos. I really dove into it. Um, last year, I took the written test, got a 94, did really well, was on my way to take the, the tasting section. Um, due to the Cicerone and COVID, there was not much flexibility in my schedule and their schedule for me to take the tasting portion. That's a sit-down portion uh, that you have to be in person. Then I ran into some issues that some of you know about, and I just really haven't been able to sit for it. I'm hoping in the spring I will officially get certified. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I really want to pass on some information. And again, I do have fun with this. So this list I have today, I'm putting a, like, a, I don't want to say it's a top 10 list. I'm not going to be ranking them like 10, 9, 8, like I'm a David Letterman show. But these are the kind of 10 styles some of you may be familiar with that I feel either the history was really interesting about them and, uh, or they were kind of gateway craft beers that kind of paved the way for future beers down the road to come um, forward. Um, or they just have like a service side that I just found very interesting. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, so the first one, again, no particular order here, is Anchor Liberty Ale, and which came out around 1975. And then and I'll try to have them pop over my shoulder just to kind of re-familiar familiarize yourself with them, as well as Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Now, you know, after the 50s and 60s, uh, I think with 1975, like I said, Anchor to Liberty came out, and some believe that's the first American pale ale style. Um, and then in 1978, I believe Jimmy Carter had uh, signed the law to allow for home brewing. Well, you know, U.S. home brewers, the only text they really had to base things on were... Um, old UK British ale texts. So they based the, 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 American, the American pale ale based upon English bitter styles. And I think it was 1981, 82 is when Sierra Nevada had uh, kind of came out. And at that time, those beers, nowadays those beers are kind of just like American pale ale, not very hoppy or whatever. When those beers came out, they were like tremendous um, hoppy beers, bitter beers. Um, so nowadays you would have it next to some of your American IPAs or your West Coast IPAs. You would be like, this is no big deal. Um, but they were really kind of the, the forerunner of the craft beer industry in the mid to late 70s as well as the, the early 80s. Um, you know, uh, if the, I actually call Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, kind of the, the first smash ale. If you ever had a brewery, S, capital S-M-A-S-H, which is a um, acronym for single malt and single hop beer. So they use kind of one malt. Now, I really shouldn't say that actually about Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. They probably do, do use a little bit of crystal malt in there. Um, but definitely one hops. They use Cascade hops and I believe American Liberty, uh, Anchor Liberty uh, which is another West Coast uh, brewery. Sierra Nevada does have a brewery. A, a friend reminded me the other day that um, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, there is a brewery. But they did begin out in the, in, the, in the West. So, and then they opened up some, like Sam Adams, they've opened up a few breweries elsewhere um, in the United States. They probably subcontract them out. Um, so again, the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and Anchor Liberty Ale. Uh, the second beer that I really feel our style of beer that has been very influential over the years is Trappist beers. And I've talked about some Trappist beers and I have a couple other to talk about in upcoming videos. Um, but one in particular called Orval, O-R-V-A-L. I'll have it pop over on my shoulder here. And the interesting thing, this is more about the history of Orval, Orval or Orval, I, I think I pronounce it was, you know, 
There was a Princess Matilda, or maybe Queen Matilda, from Tuscany that was in Belgium. And she was there, and this is at least the, the, where the legend comes from. You know, there's no verification. Some of the beer history is, some of it we know for fact, and some of it was just kind of legend. Um, well, the legend with her was that she had lost her ring and her wedding ring. And she was so distraught, and she's like, look, she goes, if, if someone can find my wedding ring, I will build a monastery in, in this town or whatever with all the money that I have. Well, out, out of the water comes this, she had dropped in the water. Out of the water comes this trout with this ring in her mouth, okay? Um, how it got in its mouth, or, you know, that's obviously, we'll leave that for legend, but that's kind of, but there is, uh, you know, some truth to the history or the legend of it. And not to say truth, but the fact is, if you look at Orval, and again, it's going to be on my shoulder. Maybe I'll do a blow-up screen of it. Their emblem is a trout with a ring in its mouth. So she did build this, you know, monastery or, or whatever in Orval. And or Orval brews one style of beer um, there. And it is a Trappist beer. And I won't go delve too much into what makes it Trappist and not Trappist. I have other videos posted. If you're really interested, you can uh, listen about, listen to them. Um, besides regular fermentation, they use, it's one of the styles that uses something called Brettomyces, which is another bacteria that, uh, or sort of yeast, another yeast that acts on the beer. And they bottle condition it like a lot of Trappist beers for the carbonation, remember. Um, eats a little sugar, the CO2 hits the cap and goes in there and there's a sediment at the bottom. Well, that gives you a, a barnyard, uh, wool blanket um, type of uh, horse kind of blanket type of flavor. Now that does, and I perceive it as kind of cherry. Um, and it's aged at least, you know, a couple of years or so and they bottle it and uh, there's, so there's so definitely some uniqueness to the bottle. If I ever get a style, I'll go into more detail about it. But Orval is one that if you, you want to check out, it definitely has a more unique flavor. But the, the, the history on it, I always found it very fascinating. So that's why I kind of brought that up. So if you ever see the labels and they got this ring and the trout has it, that's the, the reason why. The next beer is Guinness Stout. Okay, I did a whole video on Guinness Stout and nitrogenated beers, and you can reference that on, on the full history. This one I'll just talk briefly about because remember, you know, Guinness, and we talk about a lot of dark style beers, especially UK styles uh, or Irish styles in this case too. I think in that video I kind of misspoke and I was focusing on English, uh, but I obviously have to say Irish too. Um, but I did say UK. All started from Porter history. And in that video I do talk a little bit more about Porter history, but it kind of spawned off, you know, stout, in the UK and then, you know, obviously the United States, you know, we've been, you know, very heavily stout driven. And I have another beer coming up here that probably paid the way a little bit, but, you know, for historical sense, Guinness and Irish stout um, really is a very influential and historical beer that I, I really feel should have a little bit more attention. Um, that one also because of the Daniel Wheeler and um, uh, developed the, the roasting drum. I believe it was 1817, uh, they get the roasted uh, malt so that they can use two pale rows. So again, go back to that video if you're really uh, interested in there. The next beer, um, staying on the stout side, is North uh, Coast Old Rasputin, which is a really a Russian imperial stout. They've taken away the Russian side of it. it has nothing to do with the conflict in Ukraine. Um, but it was a stout that, you know, they had brewed in... Uh, you know, as an English style, UK style that they sent over to uh, Russia and the parliament, everything loved it. They made it very strong. It was called Russian Imperial Stout. It, they dropped the term Russian f over the years. And, you know, because of the same thing I had mentioned with the uh, craft brewing industry or the home brewing industry here, uh, you know, we, we took that style here in the United States. And now Imperial Stout has become almost exclusively a American style uh, beer or brewed more commonly here. So North Coast Old Rasputin was kind of one of the ones, one of the early beers that were, have been brewed for years and not 15, 20 years. Don't, don't mark my words on the exact, I think it was 19, actually I think about it, it was like 1988 or so it came out. It's won awards for many years. And nowadays when you look at your brew store, what do a lot of craft breweries do? They brew in a lot of imperial stouts. Now, the imperial means it's a higher alcoholic strength. Stout, 
usually has roasted barley and chocolate malts and things like that. So it's a very rich beer. Um, but North Coast Old Rasputin started in 1988, was one of the ones in early, early stouts that uh, kind of caught on. And a lot of them are now brewing these rich, thick imperial stouts. Um, uh, Goose Island, which has now been bought out by AB and Bev, you know, has your, uh, uh, what is it, Bourbon County uh, Oak Stouts. So all your Oak Stouts, your pastry stouts, everything probably has been like kind of an offshoot of that over the, over the years. Um, the next beer I want to go over is Kolsch. Now, Kolsch is a German style beer. It, it's very pale, it's very effervescent. It's got, you know, kind of perfumey apple pear. Um, it looks like a German Pilsner. Beer for those of you again, I'll have a pop over on my shoulder here. Now, the reason why you know it's well balanced, it's well attenuated, has a nice balance between the hops and uses German noble hops. So again, it doesn't dazzle you in the glass because it looks like a lot of a lot of styles. The reason why I want to bring this up is the service on this one is pretty fascinating. You know, the beer is it's an appellation first of all, Kolsch on the Rhine River Valley in, in Cologne. And, it, and you, to use Kolsch in Germany, um, you have to, has to be brewed in Cologne, kind of like uh, the Oktoberfest beers in Munich. And Gaffel is a common brown, Fru, if I'm pronouncing it, F-R-U-H, it has a little emblem. My German-speaking friends are gonna scream at me. Um, but it has to be brewed in Cologne, kind of like alt beer which has to be brewed in Dusseldorf, which is, again, is just up the river in the Rhine River. The reason I bring this up is I find, what I find fascinating, why it's in my quote unquote top 10 here of uh, beers, is the fact that if you're, I haven't been to Cologne, but I, uh, or Köln, I guess is the actual K-O-L and the proper German spelling of it, is they serve this beer in what they call a Stunga. It looks like a straight sided, I don't have a gla I don't have one here in my house, but um, those of you, have, when I did uh, the Ironman or Challenge Roth uh, Ironman distance in Germany, they gave me these real tall glasses, but they were straight sides up and down. The Stunga is about, I think, six ounces, and it's a straight-sided glass, but very small. Um, you almost feel your McSorley's in the city that you only get about six ounces in the glass, but this glass holds up roughly six ounces, give or take, straight-sided glass. When you're drinking it in, in Cologne, you're they give you a coaster and all they do is as you're drinking these, you just drink and when you're done and basically when the glass is done, they bring you another one and they bring you another one and they have trays after trays. They don't stop uh, bringing you the uh, new beer unless you take your coaster and stick it on top of your glass to almost like, like you had your hand on top of your glass and how they keep track of your drinking is they put little nicks in your coaster. So when you're done drinking, you put your coaster on top of your glass, that is where it ends and they tally up whatever your bill is. So this one was more for beer culture that always you know, struck me interesting. Um, I, you know, I learned a lot of that through a Pat Fahey who is a master Cicerone. He does these videos too on the Cicerone uh, YouTube channel. Um, and it always, I just rewatched it the other day. It kind of really um, stuck me out for service. So again, as you see with this top 10, it's not necessarily the best beer in the world. I love Kolsch. Um, in the United States, you'll see Kolsch style. Um, and I may actually, if I can get my hands on some in my local store here, I, I'll do a whole video strictly on Kolsch and what to expect from it. But that one was more for the service style, but it's a life gold beer. I'll have it pop up over my shoulder. Um, the next one is just Sam Adams. Okay, I've done, you know, most recently the Sam Adams uh, Beers for Cheers video, but you know, Jim Coke, I think it was in 84 when Sam Adams came around, and I think her name was Rhonda Kelman, if I can just take a look at my notes for a quick second. They put like a $100,000 investment. Now, us in the United States, you know, we're familiar with Sam Adams. And, you know, in 84 came out and made its way into, you know, pushed its way along the west, uh, to, to the west coast over the years. And, you know, now we can get uh, Sam Adams beer. I use it as my, you know, kind of my gateway, Pete's Wicked Ale, Sam Adams, probably in the early 90s, mid 90s, because I had to re refresh my memory that when I got into home brewing into mid 90s, I was using a lot of Sam Adams bottles because you want to use a cap bottle, you don't want twist off bottles. And I had a million of them, um, it's an exaggeration there, but to bottle my beer. 
So I definitely had uh, my hands on them a lot. And I, I just feel Sam Adams, you know, because of the his historical side of it, you know, kind of came out with the Boston Lager was like one of the first ones, right? Uh, Sam Adams Boston Lager and the Boston Ale was probably the, the one right next there that kind of entrenched uh, craft, you know, brewing, you know, or breweries to, to start out. I remember one of my first craft breweries, Harvest Moon, which was in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which I don't even know if it's even still there. Someone that's still living in New Jersey and New Brunswick. I know I got a lot of my Madison Central High School friends on my uh, Facebook posts. If you haven't, I'd like to know if that brewery is still there in New Brunswick. Um, so that's Sam Adams. We want to give them a little shout out. Um, the, the style, going back to styles, Doppelbach style, um, especially Polaner, Salvator, um, Doppelbach. Uh, you know, there was, you know, Bach beer's name comes from, um, and I think I talked about that on their winter Bach beer from Sam Adams, but Bach beer is, you know, in Einbach in Northern Germany, they had started uh, Bach beer. And it has to be a certain alcoholic percentage uh, to be Bach beer. Uh, but because it was brewed in Einbach, and you know, I'm saying it almost with a fake accent, and they would think, oh, Bach beer. Well, there was a group of monks that were down in, in Bavaria uh, from uh, St. Paula, and they brewed a beer called um, St. Father beer, and it took on uh, Salvator. And it was a double Bach, and they brewed it because during Lent, they would sustain their monks with this beer. And uh, they called it liquid bread. And it, as it came on, you know, they trademarked the name, the monks down the road again in, in, in Germany. And other styles came out like uh, uh, there's Spot Optimator. I talked a little bit about that in that Bach beer uh, segment that I gave. So Salvator, then there was Aug Aug uh, Augustiner, Maximator. I talked about a US brand. Eight. So if you ever see the Ader, so Bach beer, or Doppelbach beer from uh, St. Paula uh, Monks, and which is now Polana Brewery, and uh, Salvatore, and I'll get, I'll have a pop over on my shoulder. I think I had the picture on the, the Wheatbach beer from Sam Adams that I, I talked about. Um, so I'm not gonna dive into the specifics on when, you, when you're drinking that. Um, the next one that I wanna bring up is called um, Anchor Steam Beer. In the United States, we, we know this very well. We call it now California Common because Anchor, uh, trademarked the name back in, you know, I want to say they trademarked in the 70s, but again, don't hold me to the actual name. But, you know, we, since there was such German influence in the, you know, the mid 1900s and, and immigration, I talked about that in my, uh, when I did one on Budweiser, uh, you know, refrigeration wasn't around. So, you know, as the gold rush came in and everyone pushed west, um, you know, they started brewing what they called steam beer. Uh, which now has become California Common or Anchor Steam Beer, and out in, San, in the San Francisco area, and it was they used lager yeast brewed at ale temperatures, and the uni one of the unique things they do they did, and I I don't even know if they I don't think they use cooling ships anymore, but they used to, on the top of the building at Anchor Brewing they used to put them, the beer in a cooling ship. It was a, a very shallow. Um, uh, cooling vessel, I guess you want to say, instead of putting it right into fermenters. So steam would come off of the beer and it would sit there and cool and cool and they would throw them into fermenters. So it's very a shallow vessel. Um, they use it, I'm gonna talk about Lambic beer in a second, but they, they, they use uh, it to cool the beer instead of using counterflow exchangers now that they use um, or heat exchangers now for cooling the beer. Um, but it was brewed at higher temperatures so even though it's a lager or lager yeast, it, it has a lot of uh, ale type of uh, flavors and uh, components to it. So that was Anchor Steam Beer. So again, uh, again, it was like the late 1800s. Fritz Maytag had bought Anchor and kind of perfected it. Anchor or Steam Beer kind of lost a lot of favor through in the six, 1960s and so, and Fritz Maytag took took it over and it kind of changed the recipe around a little bit. So if you ever see it, there is some history to that beer. So even if you're like, yeah, I don't like that beer. I want my hoppy IPA. There is some historical um, influence on with some of these beers. So hopefully you find some of this interesting. Um, so again, because of the lack of refrigeration and they were trying to do lager beers like the Germans, uh, the latitude of the United States versus 
or those areas versus Germany, they didn't have a lot of cooling there, so they would brew that way. And, and that Anchor Steam uses a, a hop called Northern Brewer, um, which again is a minty, peppery minty type of hop that's exclusive for that beer. Kind of like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale that only uses Cascade hops, which kind of gives you that grapefruit uh, beer. The next beer I want to bring up in my list, and I, I think I'm at ten, I'm going to be at ten eventually, is Czech Premium Pale Lager. Some of you know it as Pilsner Urquell in the store. Before you stick your nose up at it or fast forward through the video, that beer, you know, it's again it's a pale golden beer. I'll try to have a picture over my shoulder. Very influential, you know, moving forward from. Uh, forming German Pilsner beers and then eventually forming American lagers and then because of the German influence in the United States. Now that beer started, it was like, I think in the 1830s over in Prague in now, I guess the Czech Republic. I think I, one video, I, I still said Czechoslovakia, but in the Czech Republic in Prague, there was this big revolt because they were not happy with the beers and they, they went into town hall in Pilsen and they dumped all the beers in the street, and they're like, I'm not gonna take this. And I, I'm almost trying to quote Pat Fahey again, my uh, mentor here, a master, master Cicerone, talk, telling the story to me, or to all of us that were watching it on his video. And so they opened up a brewery called Pilsner Urkel in the town of Pilsen. And Joseph Grohl was a German brewer from Bavaria that came on over and, and took it over. And, you know, what's unique about that beer is um, because there's a lot of soft water, uh, the, the, the hops, you know, jump a little bit or, or a little more, I should say, when they hop it, it's a little more subdued so it doesn't overpower you. Um, they use Saaz hops, S-A-A-Z. There's different pronunciations I've heard for that. But that beer was brewed. And one unique thing, it's a little darker than your German pills. It's not as attenuated, meaning it has a little bit more malt profile to it has a little diacetyl, which is a, a use uh, byproduct. But so even if you stick your nose at it, and, you know, and again, why we stick our nose at it, I think mostly in the 80s, you know, because it was in green bottles and it got skunky and people really don't really appreciate it. But if you see it in the store and you haven't had it in a while, um, you know, the, the, you know in, in the world of history of beer, the Czech Premium Pale Lager, which is the actual style name, Pilsner Urquell, it really um, should have a little respect for beers that moved on forward from their German pills and again, a lot of your American lagers and lager beers. Uh, so premium pale lager there, um, pills in Eurokel. Um, the next beer I wanna bring up is uh, from The Alchemist. Okay, we're kind of getting more into the 21st century. Um, John Kimmich started The Alchemist, and there's a beer called Hetty Topper, and I may as well bring up Focal Banger. Hetty Topper was kind of the first New England IPA, okay? Nowadays, we don't even consider it much like a New England IPA because it's not as hazy, and if you drink it side by side with some of the common New England IPAs, but very, you know, loaded with hops, you even get a particulate, and that kind of leads me to the can. You know, the can says, you know, drink from a can and even interviews with John Kimmich uh, and you know if he ever have, not that he's gonna be watching my videos you know he wanted because they felt that it and this is an interview that or an article I read from an interview I think with John and I don't know if the guy maybe should have you know maybe he wasn't supposed to bring it up or maybe he misinterpreted the interview but it makes a lot of sense is that you know in the 80s when IPAs were through the home brewing thing and we had West Coast IPA we wanted beer to be clear this was one of the first really cloudy beers. And to, to this day, if you pour this beer out and really dump everything out, there's a lot of particulate and polyphenols and, and from the beer. Nowadays, we don't even think about it, right? You're at your home brewery that bro, uh, brews a, a New England IPA. You're used to seeing that haziness. And I won't go into that with the oats and things that they use, but he had loaded up with so much hops and you pour this beer in, it, it was very cloudy. And he was, they, according to this article, okay, they were concerned that the consumer was gonna be turned off by it because in that day and age, I think it was 2003 or 2001, they thought they were gonna turn off a lot of people. So they wanted you to drink in the can so you couldn't see it. So that's kind of from this article and this one interview. I actually think, and I think a lot of people agree with me, that you wanna pour it into the glass and, and appreciate all the hops that they're using. I mean, it costs a lot of money 
uh, to, to use these hops um, in, in, in these beers. So, and I think just to get the aroma and everything, but it does look a little cloudy and murky at times, and especially if it gets a little oxidized. So again, it kind of bucks a little bit from the can and I don't think they, they've taken off the can and I'm sure anyone that would work in that brewery um, would say like, no, screw you, we, we want you to drink it from the can. But think about it, if you're opening up the can, you know, that little hole where the can is, you're not getting that aroma from the hops. You can stick your nose to it, but are we really enjoying beer that way? No, we want to pour it into the glass and appreciate it. So he was kind of the first New England IPA and, you know, probably influenced other New England IPA uh, breweries like Hills Farmstead, Trillium, uh, other ones I can't think of off the top of my head that, that brew that style, but now through the entire United States. And New England IPA, Hazy IPA, Hazy IPA, Juicy IPA have dominated the beer culture. So that's why I wanted to uh, bring up the Alchemist a little bit and give them a little props because they kind of paved the way for all those styles of beers if you enjoy them. They kind of sometimes take like grapefruit juice, mango, stone fruit juice, orange juice. Um, so even though there may be a little you know, a discrepancy on why and how we should consume that beer. I wanted to give that a little bit of, as one of my 10 beers that I think have influenced beer, even though it's not even my favorite style of beer. Um, and then um, the last style I want to bring up is the uh, Lambics or Goose, okay? I know I'm going a little bit more over time than I, I like to usually do in the, on these videos, but... Lambic or Goose, which is um, obviously Belgian style beers. And the reason for this one is just basically the unorthodox style and how this beer is brewed. And there are all many different Lambics out there and Goose, and I won't go through all the styles. I have one in front of me, I'll go di dive into that. But the big thing about Lambics or Goose, the big thing is what they call spontaneous uh, fermentation. And it's brewed in the Seine River Valley at, in, outside of Brussels. Um, there's a specific, you know, flora you know, they, they, they brew the beer or, they, you know, they have the hot wort and they put also in a cooling ship. They leave it kind of overnight in a cooling ship and it takes in all the flora and bacteria and it inoculates the beer. And that's what they're using. It starts with enterobacteria, then re uh, regular yeast. And then um, sometimes you'll get, again, Brettomyces, which I uh, talked about, that gives you kind of the barnyard, earthy, um, and it, I'm not going to, you know, I'll have a, a, a goose or a lambic. Um, a goose is a little bit more fermented than lambic, but it's, it's, in, it's in the lambic family. Goose is usually one, two, and three-year-old lambics uh, that are mixed together. And, and I won't go into the, the mixing of it, but why I want to bring it up is because it is a sour type of beer. And sour beers are very big now in, in U.S. and breweries, right? So this is like the first sour beers. And if you get a goose or anything and you, you like sours, I would try that out. Um, but it is a um, lambic or goose. And because of the spontaneous fermentation um, from the Sen River Valley, that's why I wanted to uh, bring that up. So guys, that's 10. You know, I went slightly longer than I wanted to for this top, this, uh, again, let's say a top 10 list, but those are 10 beers that I think you should give a chance if you never had them. Some of you have had, maybe it's been years or decades, but again, they, they resonated with me either because of history, um, service like Kolsch, um, paving the way for future craft beer industry, or just the uniqueness of the history or just the way it was brewed. So again, hopefully you found some of this interesting. Um, but again, this will be, you know, these types of videos I may just, you know, kind of filter in because sometimes just strictly reviewing beers um, gets old for me. But I, I, I do want to bring in some of these other things. Um, so Sierra Nevada, Anchor Liberty, um, Orval, Guinness Stout, North Coast Old Rasputin, uh, uh, Kolsch, Gaffel Kolsch or Fru or anything, you know, from Cologne, um, the, the Appalachian, Sam Adams, Polaner Doppelbach, California Steam Beer, Anchor, you know, um, Anchor Steam Beer, Czech Premium Pale Lager, Pilsner Urkel, The Alchemist, Hetty Topper, and any Lambic and Goose. So, guys, have a great day. Till next time. Take care.